is added another piece that grips the handgun. Partisans at the ATF have really run amok, infringing and trampling on the Second Amendment. AK-47 is an automatic Kalashnikov model of 1947. One of the students in my school brought three guns to school, and our entire school went on lockdown. For certain bump stock devices, like the one used in Las Vegas. Eliminating concealed carry laws. Let's dive into the Supreme Court's game-changing decision to eliminate concealed carry laws. This is some big news, so let's break it down. So picture this. You've got a state law that says if you're not a resident, you can't carry a concealed firearm within its borders. Sounds pretty straightforward, right? Well, not anymore. The Supreme Court recently dropped a bombshell by shaking up this whole concealed carry game. In a nutshell, the Supreme Court made a ruling that basically said, nope, we're not having any of that non-residents can carry concealed stuff anymore. It's like they took a giant eraser and wiped out that part of the law. What this means is that if you have a valid concealed carry permit from your home state, you might just be able to carry concealed in another state, even if you're not a resident there. Now let's talk about why this decision is such a big deal. First off, it's a landmark decision, which means it's a game changer in the world of gun laws. It's like the Supreme Court said, hey, let's rewrite the rules here. This decision has the potential to send shockwaves through the entire country because it challenges the way states have been handling concealed carry permits for non-residents. The case that brought all of this into the spotlight is the Dean Donald case. Except with the ATF, they don't even claim to be experts. That you said that all assault weapons should be banned. Is that a, is that a fair statement? Congress wants to change the law and come up with a new interpretation, then ATF will follow that new interpretation. The core mission is to prevent and protect the American people from violent crime. Our Second Amendment. It's a hell no to government trampling on our freedoms. We can expect in the future that more people will be carrying handguns on the streets in places like Los Angeles, Boston, and New York City. Dean Donald, a guy from New Hampshire, had a concealed carry permit from his home state. But here's the kicker. He got pulled over in Massachusetts for suspected DUI. And guess what? He had a concealed firearm with him. Massachusetts was like, hold up, buddy. You can't do that here. But Dean Donald wasn't having it, and he decided to challenge Massachusetts law. This Supreme Court decision, it's like a movie with a big plot twist. It's saying that the Massachusetts law, and laws like it in other states, might not be so valid anymore if you're a non-resident with a valid concealed carry permit from your home state. It's like they're rewriting the script on how states can regulate concealed carry. But here's the thing, this decision isn't just about guns, it's about rights. It's got people talking about the Second Amendment and what it really means. Some folks are cheering this decision on, saying it's a win for individual liberties, while others are worried it might lead to more guns in the hands of folks who maybe shouldn't have them. In a nutshell, this Supreme Court decision is like a seismic shift in the world of concealed carry laws. It's shaking up the status quo and making people rethink how they look at the Second Amendment and state regulations. So, whether you're pro-gun rights or all about public safety, this decision is a game-changer that's got everyone talking. The Dean Donald Case Alright, let's dig into the nitty-gritty of the Dean Donald case. This is where the concealed carry debate got real interesting. So Dean Donald, he's this guy from New Hampshire, right? He's got a valid concealed carry permit from his home state and he's probably thinking, hey, I'm good to go. I can carry my concealed firearm wherever I want. But then he decides to take a little road trip to Massachusetts. Now here's where things take a twist. Dean Donald gets pulled over by the police in Massachusetts and they think he's been hitting the sauce a bit too much, suspecting him of DUI. But when they search his car, guess what they find? Yep, a concealed firearm. Massachusetts doesn't take too kindly to this. They're like, whoa, hold on there, buddy. You can't just roll into our state packing heat without our permission. You see, Massachusetts has these laws that say if you're not a resident, you need a special non-resident concealed carry permit to carry a concealed firearm. Why is the ATF trying to say a pistol's no longer a pistol? If you use a pistol brace, it's a short barrel rifle. You're not exempting the, the same brace that you gave this letter to. If the brace is submitted, we'll classify it. Ludicrous. That doesn't, that doesn't happen. We are the lawful, legal citizens of the state. I want to be clear, this wasn't based on violence. This is ba based on threats, specifically to individuals, on gangs. Dean Donald, though, he's not having it. He's like, wait a minute, this ain't right. He decides to challenge Massachusetts' concealed carry law saying it violates his Second Amendment rights. He's basically saying, I've got a permit from my home state, and that should be enough to carry anywhere in the U.S. 
Now the thing about this case is that it's a real game changer. It's like Dean Donald threw a curveball at the whole concealed carry system. The courts have to figure out if Massachusetts is in the wrong for requiring non-residents to jump through hoops to carry concealed. This case got everyone's attention because it's not just about Dean Donald, it's about the rights of gun owners across the country. It's like a big showdown between state laws and the Second Amendment. Some folks are rooting for Dean Donald, saying that if you've got a permit, you should be able to carry anywhere. Others are worried that if the court sides with him, it might lead to more guns in the wrong hands. In a nutshell, the Dean Donald case is a real head-scratcher. It's a legal battle that could change the way we think about concealed carry laws in this country. So, whether your pro-gun rights are all about strict regulations, this case is one to watch because it's shaking things up in the world of concealed carry. The Bruin Decision Let's talk about the Bruin Decision and how it set the stage for challenging state concealed carry laws. This is like the backstory that led to the Dean Donald case. So the Bruin Decision is a pretty big deal in the world of gun rights. It's like the blueprint that some folks have been using to challenge those pesky state laws that restrict concealed carry. In the Bruin case, the Supreme Court basically said, hey states, you can't just make up any old rule you want when it comes to concealed carry. They laid down some ground rules. They said that if someone's conduct falls within the plain text of the Second Amendment, then the government can't just stomp all over their right to carry concealed. It's like the court put up a big stop sign and said, you gotta have a darn good reason to limit this right. Now this decision is super important because it's like the legal foundation for challenging state laws. It's saying that the Second Amendment isn't just a suggestion, it's a pretty strong directive. States can't just make up whatever rules they want when it comes to who can carry concealed and who can't. They have to have a good reason, a really good reason, if they want to restrict this right. So fast forward to the Dean Donald case. Dean's looking at the Bruin decision and thinking, Hey Massachusetts, do you really have a good reason to stop me from carrying concealed when I've got a valid permit from my home state? He's basically saying that if the Supreme Court already said in Bruin that states can't mess with the Second Amendment without a good reason, then Massachusetts better have a darn good reason. A pistol brace is also known, this scary piece of equipment here. Well, Mr. Wilcox, there's no law. Congress didn't pass it. That's a rule from ATF. She, she proves you can run for office and in gun violence in the South and you can win. There are approximately 40 million firearms with stabilizing braces currently in circulation. This Bruin decision is like the legal ammunition that Dean Donald and others are using to challenge these state laws. It's like they're saying, look, the Supreme Court has already set the bar and you can't just make up rules that go against it. So when you hear about all these legal battles over concealed carry laws, remember the Bruin decision. It's the legal precedent that's got folks questioning whether some of these state laws pass the sniff test when it comes to the Second Amendment. It's like the legal playing field just got a whole lot more interesting. Constitutional Scrutiny Let's dive deep into the constitutional aspects of the Dean Donald case and how the Second Amendment is at the heart of the matter. This is where things get really interesting. Okay, so the Second Amendment, it's that part of the Constitution that says something like, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. It's only 27 words, but oh boy, it caused a lot of debate over the years. Now, the Dean Donald case is all about this Second Amendment stuff. See, Dean had a concealed carry permit from his home state, New Hampshire, and he thought that should be enough to carry concealed anywhere in the U.S. The Texas House of Representatives just voted to impeach Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton. Here's a 12-round magazine. This magazine would be banned under this current bill, it doesn't fit. It could make criminals out of law-abiding citizens, and they've done that in the past. They, the ATF, do not want you to put a rifle sight on a pistol. But when he got pulled over in Massachusetts with his concealed firearm, they said, hold on a minute, buddy, you can't do that here. Dean, though, he's not just taking this lying down. He's saying that Massachusetts is violating his Second Amendment rights. He's basically arguing that the Constitution says he has a right to bear arms, and that right doesn't stop at the state line. This is where the Supreme Court's decision becomes crucial. They've basically got to decide if Dean's right. They're the ones who interpret the Constitution, so their word is kind of like the final say in this whole mess. But here's the twist. The Supreme Court has already made some important decisions about the Second Amendment in the past, like in the Bruin case we talked about earlier. In that case, they said that states can't just make up any old rule they want when it comes to concealed carry. They've got to have a really good reason to restrict that right. So when the court looks at Dean's case, they're not just thinking about him, they're thinking about how their decision could affect gun rights across the country. They're wondering if allowing states to restrict concealed carry for non-residents is in line with the Second Amendment. 
This is where it gets all legal and complex. It's like a big puzzle where the court has to balance individual rights with state laws. Some folks are cheering for Dean, saying that if you've got a permit, you should be able to carry anywhere. Others are worried that if the court rules in his favor, it might make it easier for just about anyone to carry concealed, and that could be a problem. In a nutshell, the Dean Donald case is like a high-stakes game of constitutional chess. It's all about interpreting the Second Amendment and deciding where the line is drawn when it comes to carrying concealed. Public safety concerns in a post-concealed carry landscape. Let's talk about the elephant in the room, public safety. When you start messing with concealed carry laws, a whole bunch of folks get worried and they've got some pretty valid concerns. Here's a look at what's at stake. Imagine a world where concealed carry laws are a thing of the past. That means folks with valid permits can carry their concealed firearms just about anywhere, without much red tape. Sounds like freedom, right? Well, hold on, because it's not that simple. One of the big concerns is that we might see more people carrying concealed firearms without those strict background checks and training that concealed carry laws usually require. It's like opening the floodgates, and that's got some folks worried. They're concerned that if you eliminate these laws, it might become easier for individuals who shouldn't have guns to get their hands on them. Now let's talk about law enforcement. These folks have a tough job already, but if you take away concealed carry laws, it could make things even trickier. They're used to dealing with folks who have permits and have gone through the proper channels. But if anyone and everyone can carry concealed, how do they know who's a responsible gun owner and who's not? Think about it from a cop's perspective. They're responding to a call and they have no idea if the person they're dealing with is carrying a concealed firearm. That's got to put them on edge, right? It's like a game of Russian roulette, but with lives at stake. That's not a right of government. That's a right that each of us has as Americans. Under the new rule, these firearm owners will be required to obtain special registration, surrender or destroy their brave. I'm sure it's enormously high. It's 36 per 100,000 people. That a firearm equipped with a stabilizing brace was, quote, would not be subject to the National Firearms Act. Public safety isn't just about the police, though. It's about regular folks like you and me. When you walk down the street, you want to feel safe, right? But if anyone can carry concealed without those background checks, it could make some people uneasy. They won't know if the person next to them is a responsible gun owner or not. And let's not forget about those background checks. Concealed carry laws usually require a thorough check to make sure folks aren't dangerous or mentally unstable. But if you scrap those laws, who's checking? It's like taking a gamble with public safety. So while it's great to talk about freedom and individual rights, we've also got to think about the flip side. Public safety is a big deal, and it's something we can't afford to ignore. So when we're debating whether to eliminate concealed carry laws, we've got to ask ourselves, are we willing to take that risk? Are we willing to put public safety on the line? It's a tough call, and it's got a lot of people thinking long and hard about the consequences. Voices of Dissent All right, let's dive into the fascinating world of the Supreme Court and see how those justices are splitting hairs when it comes to the Dean Donald case and the Second Amendment. So, picture this. You've got these nine highly respected legal minds sitting on the Supreme Court bench, and they're all looking at the same case. But guess what? They're not all seeing eye to eye. Nope, they're splitting hairs on this one, and it's making for some heated debates. On one side, you've got the justices who are all about protecting Second Amendment rights. They're looking at Dean Donald's case and thinking, hey, this guy's got a valid permit from his home state. He should be able to concealed carry anywhere in the U.S. without jumping through hoops. They see this as a win for individual liberties, and they're not too concerned about the potential risks. But then on the other side of the aisle, you've got justices who are raising some serious red flags. They're looking at this decision and thinking, hold on a minute, if we say that states can't restrict concealed carry for non-residents, we might be opening the floodgates to all sorts of folks carrying concealed, including those who shouldn't. They're all about keeping public safety in check, and they're worried that this decision might make it easier for the wrong people to get their hands on firearms. It's like a legal tug-of-war between these two camps. On one side, you've got justices saying, we need to protect individual rights. And on the other side, you've got justices saying, we need to protect the public. It's a classic clash of values, and it's making for some serious legal drama. These pistol braces make a normal, law-abiding person suddenly a violent criminal is bizarre. Connecticut delegation, which is incredible. I think on this issue and many others, you're the best delegation in the United States. When somebody bump fires, think of this 
as a bump fire stock and able to move. Need to uh, actually make laws without congressional approval. They're really there to enforce laws. The ATF is not supposed to make law. That is supposed to be left up to Congress. What makes this even more interesting is that the Supreme Court decisions have a ripple effect. They set legal precedents that lower courts follow and they shape the way laws are interpreted across the country. So whatever these justices decide in the Dean Donald case, it's going to have a big impact on gun rights and regulations. In a nutshell, the voices of dissent among the Supreme Court justices show just how complex and divisive this issue is. It's not just a matter of interpreting the Second Amendment, it's about finding the right balance between individual freedoms and public safety. And that's a debate that's likely to keep raging on for years to come. Beyond the courtroom. Now let's take a step outside the courtroom and see how the Supreme Court's decision in the Dean Donald case is causing ripples that reach far beyond the legal world. This decision has some real-world consequences that go way beyond just interpreting the law. First up, we've got society as a whole. You see, when the Supreme Court makes a decision like this, it's not just a legal judgment. It's a signal to society about what's acceptable and what's not. So if they say, hey, non-residents can carry concealed without too much fuss, it's like giving a green light to people who want to carry concealed firearms. That's got some folks excited, but others are pretty concerned. For those who are all about personal freedoms and the right to bear arms, this decision might feel like a victory. They'll argue that it's a win for individual liberties and the idea that responsible citizens should be able to protect themselves. But on the flip side, there are those who see it as a potential threat to public safety. They're worried that making concealed carry easier could mean more firearms in public spaces, and that could lead to more accidents, misunderstandings, and even confrontations. Yeah, I was, when I was in 11th grade and Joe Biden made our schools gun-free school zones. Banning a class of weapons that you don't like the look of, not because of functionality. As a kid, I came out of a different movement, the civil rights movement. This rule redefined firearms with stabilizing braces. Most apparent here a defense of the Second Amendment, which this most certainly is. And within less than 15 minutes, you can walk out the front door here with a rifle or a shotgun. Not one more! Not one more! Not one more! ATF agreed to, in 2012, should not be under the jurisdiction of your rule. Now, let's talk about law enforcement. Cops already have a tough job, and this decision might just make it a whole lot tougher. You see, they're used to dealing with folks who have gone through the proper channels to get their concealed carry permits. They know who's legal and who's not. But if anyone and everyone can carry concealed, it's like a guessing game for them. They have to assume that anyone they'll encounter might be armed, and that can make their job a whole lot riskier. Plus, think about background checks. Concealed carry laws usually require a thorough check to make sure folks aren't dangerous or mentally unstable, but if you scrap those laws, who's checking? It's like taking a gamble with public safety, and that's got law enforcement agencies pretty concerned. So beyond the legal debates, this Supreme Court decision is shaking up society and law enforcement practices. It's sparking conversations about the balance between individual freedoms and public safety. Some folks are cheering it on, saying it's a step toward more freedom, while others are worried about the potential consequences for our communities and those tasked with keeping us safe. In a nutshell, this decision has real-world effects that touch every one of us. It's not just about interpreting the law, it's about shaping the way we live, interact, and ensure our safety in a world where concealed carry laws are changing. And that's a conversation that affects us all. National Concealed Carry Reciprocity The concept of national concealed carry reciprocity, a hot-button issue that has folks on both sides of the gun debate fired up. This idea could reshape the way we think about concealed carry laws in the U.S., so here's the deal. Right now, each state has its own rules and regulations when it comes to concealed carry. If you've got a permit in one state, it might not be valid in another. That's where national concealed carry reciprocity comes into play. Imagine a scenario where your concealed carry permit is like your driver's license. It's good anywhere in the country. So if you jump through all the hoops in your home state to legally carry concealed, you can do the same thing when you're on vacation or traveling for work without worrying about breaking any laws. Earlier this year, the ATF issued a rule that unilaterally puts new restrictions on Second Amendment rights. 96% of mass public shootings happen in an area where guns are banned. The extent to which this is an unconstitutional violation of our Second Amendment rights. Gives private, private citizens the right to possess a firearm, including a pistol. Now, this might sound like a dream come true for some folks. They see it as a way to protect Second Amendment rights and make life easier for responsible gun owners. 
Plus, it could cut through a lot of red tape and confusion for those who travel across state lines regularly. But as you can probably guess, not everyone's on board with this idea. Critics worry that national concealed carry reciprocity could undermine the stricter gun control measures in some states. They fear that states with strict regulations might be forced to honor permits from states with looser rules, potentially compromising public safety. Let's not forget the law enforcement angle. If this concept becomes reality, it's going to make life interesting for cops. They'll have to figure out who's carrying legally and who's not, all while dealing with folks from different states with different rules. It's like a big jurisdictional puzzle. The big question here is whether national concealed carry reciprocity is a solution to a problem or a recipe for confusion. Some folks say it's a way to protect gun rights and simplify the lives of responsible gun owners, while others argue it could lead to unintended consequences like more firearms in public spaces and difficulties for law enforcement. The Great Balancing Act Ah, the delicate balancing act between individual liberties, especially Second Amendment rights, and the ever-important concern for public safety. It's a tension that's at the core of the Dean Donald case and many other debates surrounding firearms regulations. On one side of the scale, you've got individual liberties. The U.S. is all about personal freedoms. The Second Amendment is a shining example of that. It says that people have the right to keep and bear arms. For many, that's a sacred and non-negotiable right. They argue that if you've gone through the process to legally carry concealed, that right shouldn't be hindered no matter where you are in the country. But here's the twist. On the other side of the scale, you've got public safety. It's like the government's duty to ensure the well-being of its citizens. And when it comes to firearms, that's where things get tricky. Critics of looser concealed carry laws say that making it too easy for anyone to carry concealed can lead to all sorts of problems. They worry about accidents, misunderstandings, and even escalating conflicts when more people are packing heat in public. So here's the million-dollar question, how do we strike the right balance? It's like walking a tightrope over a pit of alligators. You don't want to fall too much on either side. So the, so the shooter can shoot the pistol with one hand. Percentage of the shootings were done by semi-automatic weapons or rifles. The number one weapon that they use. The Second Amendment to the United States Constitution, Mr. Now what happened with Fast and Furious, with these traced guns that they lost, thousands of them? The ATF decided to change a regulation or an interpretation of the regulation, and so they may just want to SBR right off the bat. Proponents of looser regulations argue that responsible gun owners are just that, responsible. They believe that the more people who are armed, the safer society becomes and it could deter crime. But critics worry that this Wild West mentality could end up doing more harm than good, especially if it becomes easier for individuals who shouldn't have firearms to get their hands on them. The Dean Donald case is just one piece of the puzzle, but it's shining a bright spotlight on this fundamental debate. The Supreme Court's decision will have consequences that ripple across the nation, influencing not only how we view concealed carry, but also how we view the balance between individual liberties and the safety of our communities. Second Amendment in Contemporary America The Supreme Court's decision in the Dean Donald case isn't just a one-off event. It's part of an ongoing dialogue about Second Amendment rights in modern America. The Second Amendment, with its famous words about the right to keep and bear arms, has been a cornerstone of American identity since the nation's founding. It's also been the source of heated debates, legal battles, and evolving interpretation. And that's exactly where we find ourselves today. The Dean Donald case is just one chapter in this long-running story. It's a story of how we, as a society, grapple with the balance between individual liberties and public safety. It's a story of how we interpret a 27-word amendment in a world that's vastly different from the one our founding fathers knew. This decision, like those that have come before it, has sparked conversations around dinner tables, in classrooms, and on the news. It's made people rethink their positions on gun rights and gun control it's led to passionate debates about what it means to be an American and how we safeguard our freedoms while also ensuring the safety of our communities. It wasn't a fully automatic machine gun that was banned in 1986. It wasn't the bump stock. You gave testimony that the brave ATF agents are the ones showing up at two in the morning after a burglary. <laughs> No guns were lost. They were stolen by an individual who's now in prison. That requirement for showing a heightened need for self-defense, that was the teeth of these permitting laws. 
specifically said that. I, but I said. The, what, this, is manda- what does mandatory mean? I'm trying to say that. It means that prosecutors get a choice. Details of the law, but folks, listen to it at home. Here's a quick summary of what's law. Lo- That's what gun control is all about. The ultimate goal is an unarmed and subjugated America. But here's the thing. These debates aren't going away. The Dean Donald case might be the hot topic of the moment, but it's just one piece of a much larger puzzle. Gun rights, regulations, and the Second Amendment will continue to be at the forefront of our national discourse. As we move forward, we'll have to grapple with tough questions. How do we balance the rights of individuals with the need to protect the public? How do we ensure responsible gun ownership while preventing firearms from ending up in the wrong hands? How do we navigate the complexities of a diverse and ever-changing society while honoring our historical values? The Dean Donald case is a reminder that the conversation about the Second Amendment is far from settled. It's a dynamic and evolving discussion that reflects the complexities of our nation. As we look ahead, one thing is certain, the dialogue will continue, the debates will rage on, and the quest for a balanced and just approach to firearms regulation will persist in contemporary America. That's all for this video, folks. We'll see you next time.